Tu parc de-al tău. Eu te văd prin cinci de ani. Te văd prin cinci de ani. Thank you for those uh, very generous words. Program Director, Ms. Ridi Klabi, Archbishop Emeritus, Desmond Tutu, and dear wife, Mamlia Tutu. His Grace, Archbishop Tabo Mahoba, the Tutu family, particularly Reverend Mpo Tutu the Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Cape, Professor Pretorius, the Mayor of the City of Cape Town, Ms. Patricia DeLille, the many esteemed guests in the room, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the Pub Protector South Africa team. I cannot express what an honor it is to stand before you and deliver the fifth Desmond Tutu Annual Peace Lecture. This year's lecture is themed Peace and Democracy. What's law got to do with it? <laughs> Incidentally, the dialogue is in line with goal 16 of the recently adopted UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is dedicated to the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, the provision of access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable institutions at all levels. Following on the footsteps of giants such as His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the former UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, former island president, Mrs. Mary Robinson, one of the elders, Ms. Grasa Marshall, is a singular honor. But ladies and gentlemen, the greatest honor for me is the opportunity established by this lecture to be associated with Archbishop Tutu, a quintessential seventh leader and global iconic crusader for justice, peace, and human goodness, or Ubuntu. I've admired Bishop Tutu since I was a child. Happy birthday, Arch. <laughs> May you have blessings, good health, and many more birthdays. I'm grateful to the Desmond and Leah Tutu Foundation, particularly Reverend Mpo Tutu, for this cherished honor. This honor follows just after I was awarded, surprisingly, a Peace and Justice Award by the Anglican Church. And for this, I thank uh, Bishop Mahoga. <clears throat> but I'm just generally grateful to the Anglican community and the faith community in general for the support we are receiving as the office uh, is the Pub Protector South Africa. On my first direct contact with Archbishop Tutu, he unintentionally gave us a practical lesson in servant leadership, and I'm certain he has forgotten that. It was in the 90s in his office where a Swedish colleague, Alan Gustafsson and I interviewed him about the impact of European funding on human rights during the apartheid years. His warmth and respect for fellow human beings was amazing. But for me, it was a small act of stepping up and serving us tea that left me in awe of him. Incidentally, we did not respect him less for serving us. That simple act of servant leadership 
left us more in awe of him as a leader. Little did I know then that two decades later, I would have the honor of giving a, le a lecture celebrating his legacy as a servant leader and as a crusader for justice, peace, and general human goodness. The central point I want to make today is that law can be a healing and transformative force. Law can be a healing force that fosters peace in a democratic society and the global community by promoting more social justice, human solidarity, and accountability. I also want to indicate that there are certain conditions, though, that must prevail before the law can be a healing and transformative force, and that one of those conditions is the rule of law. I'm deeply encouraged to note the room is full of young and old persons from diverse backgrounds. I suppose it even makes it more gratifying knowing that the people in this room had to forgo an equally important task of supporting our spring box. <laughs> this gives me and my team from the Power Protector South Africa hope that we are all joined like ancient societies in pursuit of the same cause of optimum of optimal conditions for our survival as a people or human race. And we are all collectively pursuing the enjoyment of life by all of us. Like Archbishop Tutu, Mamlia Tutu, and the, and the Legacy Foundation, we are here because of our collective concern for our common fate as a country as a continent and as part of the world. Can we reflect for a moment on what would be the outcome if we were not concerned or doing something about our shared fate? James Patrick Kinney's poem titled The Cold Within may have an answer for us. The poem, written in the 60s, tells us the story of six humans trapped by happenstance on a bitterly cold, dark night. According to James Pat Patrick Kenny, these six humans were sitting around a dying fire. And each one of them had in their possession a log that could revive the dying fire. The first person looked across and noted a person from a different racial group. He decided he was not going to use his log because he didn't want somebody from outside his race to benefit from his log. The second person looked across and saw somebody who was not from her church. It wasn't even a different religion. As we saw today, we had a Jewish rabbi speaking to us. It was a different church. She decided to keep her lock because she did not want somebody from a different church to benefit from her lock. A poor person sitting on one side of the fire saw a rich person across. He decided he wasn't going to use his log because he did not want to benefit the filthy rich. The rich person, not knowing what was on the mind of the poor person, saw the poor person across. And he decided he wasn't going to benefit the lazy poor from his lock. 
A historically disadvantaged person noted members of a historically advantaged group and decided it was time for revenge and he withheld his lock. The sixth person, a mercenary who had never done anything except for gain, decided to withhold his lock on account of the fact that his companions were not in a position to pay him for his lock. The, the poem ends as you probably have predicted. Rick Kenny tells us they did not die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. When James Patrick Kinney wrote the poem about half a century ago, he sought to discourage apathy in the face of injustice and wrongdoing. He was alerting us to what primitive societies seem to have known all along, that ensuring human solidarity and social justice is not an act of charity, but an act of sustainable self-preservation. That seemingly is something that the UN is increasingly aware of. Most societies have a proverb to the effect that it is impossible to light your companion's path without brightening your own. There's another saying that is common in all societies that says that as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. In this country, we call this Ubuntu. I am because you are. Ubuntu is a value that the Constitutional Court in S versus Makwanyane said is one of the values underpinning our constitutional democracy. The court also said that the value of Ubuntu is embodied in the constitutional value of human dignity. Now, we know that James Patrick Kinney's selfish and parochial humans died because they failed to appreciate the interconnectedness of humanity. They failed to appreciate that to save themselves for self-preservation, self they had to prevent the suffering of others. They had to share what they had with others and perhaps extend social justice to their companions. But what does self-preservation or James Patrick Kinney's poem have to do with our conversation on law, peace, and democracy today? Firstly, I believe that there's a link and that the conversation on law's relevance to peace and democracy is, is a timely conversation as we navigate a deeply troubled world, desperately search searching for peace and inclusive development. You will agree with me that other than the two world wars at the beginning of the 20th century, the world has never been in so much turmoil. As humanity, we've never found ourselves in such a desperate search for peace, regardless of where we are, whether we're dealing with violent crime or civil wars domestically, global terrorism, and ongoing conflict between some states. Peace is something the world is desperately searching for right now. As we reflect more than more than half a century since James Patrick Kinney's poem was penned, can we say that we're doing better with regard to sharing our collective habitat, planet Earth? Are we not perhaps where we are because somehow as we progressed with we began to behave like some or all of James Patrick Kinney's people. If indeed we did lose our way, 
regarding social justice and human solidarity. Can the way forward lie in our conversation on laws relevance to peace and democracy? My answer is yes to both questions. My proposition is that peace is elusive today in our common habitat as humanity because we have failed on the values of social justice and human solidarity. I believe that social injustice compounded by impunity or lack of accountability is a key threat to peace and stability within nations and between nations. I also respectfully believe that as a country too, we are not where we should be in regard to the values of social justice and human solidarity. Despite our collective commitment to these values as, re as reflected in the constitution, we have adopted as our lodestar and roadmap to the South Africa we want to become. It is also my belief that because of these failures, sustainable peace is out of our grasp at the moment. How do law and democracy fit in? I'm certain you'll agree with my assertion that the South Africa we have today, with its globally admired groundbreaking constitution, is founded on faith in the transformative power of the law. Our constitutional democracy is also anchored in the belief in the importance of the rule of law and democracy with regard to ensuring sustainable peace. You're yeah, probably already thinking quietly though, but law is not everything. With society being a system, there are no single causal factors and or silver bullets for any social problem or issue. You are right. Law is not everything. It doesn't cause everything and it doesn't solve everything. But it is a great part of the solution. But you're probably also thinking that law does not necessarily foster peace. That too is true, particularly if you believe as the African Union does that as the, African Union believe, as the African Union believes in its roadmap on silencing the guns in Africa by 2020, that peace is more than the absence of war. And I agree with you, Professor. As a country emerging from years of legalized oppression and discrimination and apartheid and colonialism, we are all aware that law can be an instrument of oppression. Apartheid was essentially about using the law to institutionalize inequality and oppression. The end result was a certain level of order, but no peace. Incidentally, the apartheid government didn't try to have peace. It was about law and order anyway. State institutions such as the police and the courts were part of the machinery keeping alive structural inequality as they enforced laws such as the Group Areas Act, Immorality Act, and Black Administration Act, among others. Through an endeavor to legitimize the state, some of these institutions played some role though in ensuring a limited amount of justice or a semblance of justice. What then does it take for the law to facilitate peace and democracy? I believe the architects of our constitutional democracy had the foresight 
of what it takes for law to foster democracy and peace. They also appear to have been aware of the symbiotic relationship between law and democracy. I will return to this point shortly when I briefly touch on chapter nine of the Constitution, which creates innovative administrative and accountability institutions to support and strengthen constitutional democracy. It is my considered view that the single most important factor that makes law an important contributor to peace and democracy is the rule of law. In this regard, it's important to note that the existence of laws that are enforced, no matter how rigorously per se, does not mean there's, there's a rule of law. The apartheid state and some of the oppressive regimes in the world today are exemplary in this regard. It's often said that under apartheid, there was rule by law as opposed to the rule of law. What is the difference between rule by law and the rule of law? The key difference is that in a rule of law state, law and justice are on the same side. The rule of law general, generally refers to a state of affairs where people are governed by rules rather than arbitrary decisions of those exercising state or public power and, and where the rules are general and certain, known by all affected and uniformly or equally applied to all. According to the World Justice Project, the following four universal principles are needed for the rule of law to be in place. One, government and its officials and agents, as well as individuals and private entities, are accountable under the law. That's uniform accountability for everyone, not some. Two, the laws are clear, publicized, stable, and just. They are applied evenly and protect fundamental rights, including the security of persons and property. Three, the process by which the laws are enacted, administered, and enforced is accessible, fair, and efficient. Four, justice is delivered timely by competent, ethical, and independent representatives and neutrals who are of sufficient number, have adequate resources, and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. You will note that aspects of democratic governance are built into the rule of law principles. For example, people need to participate meaningfully in the making of laws, and those that deliver justice have to be competent, ethical, and deliver services expeditiously. Why is the rule of law important for peaceful coexistence? It's simply because we become part of a collective so that our fate is better than when we are alone. Would you agree with me? The only reason you'll be part of a community is to improve your fortunes, not to decrease your fortunes. If the collective is governed unjustly, and we are treated unfairly or excluded from collective resources or benefits, we cannot be happy or peaceful.
for your understanding. Firstly, I would like to apologize on behalf of the Public Protector South Africa that the drama that started a few weeks ago in, in, in relation to our work has been brought here. I just want to indicate that the young people are following up on an investigation. They're not the complainants. They've only written to me about three weeks ago asking me why this investigation is being delayed. The complainant is advocate Paul Hoffman, who's here from Cape Town, and we've kept him abreast of developments in the investigation. It is a very complex investigation and has involved a whole lot of people. So I do apologize that um, they've decided to bring the drama here. We do deal with complainants and we give them feedback. But even though they're not complainants, when they wrote to me, I did write to them to indicate where the holdup is. And I did indicate to them that when we submit the report to advocate Paul Hoffman and others, they will also be made aware of our findings. Now back to the issue of peace and democracy. <laughs> I must say though, in a twisted way, what happened today is a reflection of what happens when some of the elements of the rule of law are missing. The last part about the rule of law that I read is justice is delivered timely by competent, ethical, and independent representative and, root, and, and neutrals who are sufficient in number. So one of the issues that we've raised uh, is, is the need for adequate resources. Now, Archbishop Desmond Tutu once said the following, I quote, the rule of law matters to all of us, to the entire human family. Strengthening the rule of law is an essential ingredient to enhance justice, peace, and economic and social progress. The absence of the rule of law the rule of law underpins functional societies and drives development, and that's something similar to what Professor Pretorius said earlier. It is for this reason that I believe that social justice, human solidarity, and accountability have to be promoted by the law if it is to meaningfully foster peace. I believe this is part of the vision and architecture of our constitutional democracy. In the case called City Council of Pretoria versus Walker, decided in 1998, the Constitutional Court said that the Constitution is a bridge from our past. In that discussion about a bridge from our past, the Constitution the Constitutional Court mentioned the achievement of equality as part of the constitutional deal. Part of the impact expected from the Constitution as the basic law from which all laws are to be rooted or benchmarked is transformation of society to achieve equality in other aspects of social justice. According to then Chief Justice Pius Langa, during his Harvard address on the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Charter in 2005, that expected transformation of society incorporates the elimination of poverty. I fully agree. The constitutional preamble clearly promotes human solidarity and social justice. It promises to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of every person. 
But we also know that laws on their own do not change lives. They need to be honestly and consistently applied so that they can make the difference they were made to make. In this regard, it is important that the majority of citizens and residents ethically comply with their laws and that when that fails, those affected by the failure know their rights and have access to credible institutions to address alleged injustices or wrongs. In this regard, the World Justice Project's rule of law principles are instructive. Also important is the implementation of laws. Good laws sitting in shelves do not change human lives. An example in this regard is chapter five of the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act. 15 years after this law was passed, it is still not implemented. It's still waiting for a presidential proclamation to put it into law. This is the opposite of a constitutional commitment to the achievement of equality as a value. You will recall that section 9.2 of the Constitution anticipates legislative measures to redress the imbalances of apartheid, patriarchy, colonialism, and other historical injustices. Again, failure to implement a law cannot be said to be consistent with the rule of law. In this regard, who is to say that our rising inequalities cannot be duly attributed to this inexplicable lapse. What happens when compliance with the law, including the Constitution, fails? Firstly, it is important to note that in contemporary democracies, the Constitution as part of the law is a powerful instrument to foster democracy. Contemporary democracies like South Africa are constitutional, are democracies where the constitution is supreme and the final word on what the constitution says is belonging to the courts. Here I must indicate though that in modern democracies such as ours, The Constitution can only yield transformative outcomes if we use it with the understanding that it's a, transform it's a transformational instrument. If we blindly borrow jurisprudence from old democracies, our Constitution will not yield the, transformation, the transformational results that it was meant to yield. In this regard, we must applaud our constitutional court because it has, expelled, it, it has excelled in interpreting this constitution as a unique constitution. It has done groundbreaking work, particularly with regard to the justiciability of socioeconomic rights. What about the facts that the courts are not always accessible and that courts engage in a dialogue that is pretty much exclusive? It is pretty much the domain of lawyers. Again, modern democracies have provided other structures to supplement the courts. For example, we have what we refer to as ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution mechanisms or appropriate dispute resolution mechanisms, such as arbitration, CCMA, etc. Even the small claims court is critical as an avenue for civil disputes involving small amounts of money. So all of that is built to ensure that we, we have good laws, 
and those good laws are known by people, and there are avenues available for people to vindicate their rights. But what about access to justice and accountability when the wrongdoer is the state? The question of access to justice and accountability for state wrongs is particularly complex in the complex modern state where the state is a large, powerful entity and within the state, oppressive and indifferent bureaucracies often emerge. In that case, the traditional checks and balances help, but they do not solve all of the problems. We know that about 206 years ago already, Sweden noticed that the original checks and balances, what we refer to as the trias politica, was not enough to check excesses in the exercise of state power. An ombudsman office was introduced in this regard. Many democracies have introduced these administrative bodies, not just ombudsman bodies, administrative oversight bodies. Some of them would be called anti-corruption commissions. Some would be called investigators general, ethics watchdogs, integrity watchdogs, supreme audit bodies, and human rights commissions. And of course, then we have the ombudsman bodies or bodies dealing with maladministration. These are crucial institutions. But it's important that we note that these administrative oversight bodies, which are new in public accountability, can only make a difference where there is the rule of law. They can also make a difference when their powers are understood and accepted, and where complementary integrity institutions, including the courts, the media, and civil society watchdogs, are functional. The rule of law aspect in the value of administrative accountability bodies is important particularly when it comes to the issue of horizontal accountability. These institutions are new. We know the courts, we know parliament, and we know, we know the executive powers. We have brought in new children when it comes to curbing excesses in the exercise of public power. For them to function properly, space must be provided for them to function. In this regard, I wish to draw your attention to the powers of my office, the Pub Protector South Africa. In the case of the Pub Protector versus the Mail and Guardian, decided by the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2012, the Supreme Court of Appeal said the following about the office, I quote, the Office of the Pub Protector is an important institution. It provides what will often be the last defense against bureaucratic oppression and against corruption and malfeasance in public office that is capable of insidiously destroying the nation. If the institution falters or finds itself undermined, the nation loses an indispensable constitutional guarantee." Close quotes. This is, is in line with the understanding of former President Nelson Mandela, who said the following, even the most benevolent of governments are made up of people with all the propensities for human failings. The rule of law as we understand it consists in the set of conventions and arrangements that ensure that it is not left to the whims of individual rulers to decide what is good for the populace. The administrative conduct of government and authorities are subject to scrutiny by independent organs. This is an essential element of good governance that we have, heard, we have sought to have built into our new constitutional order. An essential part of that constitutional architecture is those state institutions supporting constitutional democracy. Among those are the Pub Protector, the Human Rights Commission, the Auditor General, the Independent Electoral Commission, the Commission on Gender Equality, the Constitutional Court, and others. He then says uh, it was never reason for irritation, but rather a source of comfort for him when these bodies were asked to adjudicate on the conduct 
on his conduct and that of his government and that he willingly complied. What really then is the nature of the public protector? I've indicated that for peace, for law to play its role in fostering peace and democracy, firstly, we must have good laws. Secondly, we must have transformative laws if already there are, there are structural inequalities in society. Thirdly, there must be willingness by the people to comply with the laws and those who implement them, there must be willingness to implement those laws. But fourthly, they have to be institutions that enforce the laws. Principally, these would be the courts and the other state institutions such as parliament and, and the executive would have to play their role in making sure that things are done in accordance with the law. I've also then mentioned that there are administrative institutions that modern states have introduced to supplement the traditional order to make sure that there are avenues to hold the state accountable and to hold ordinary people accountable. Different institutions have been introduced. And within the state, in South Africa, we have chapter nine, which creates a number of institutions. These institutions are independent, and chapter nine, section one, uh, section 181, in chapter nine says that these institutions are independent and they support and strengthen constitutional democracy. It then mentions them as the Public Protector Human Rights Commission and all of the others that President Nelson Mandela mentioned. Section 182 one is important because it specifically states that these institutions are subject only to the constitution and the law. My understanding then is that their decisions cannot be second guessed by anyone, including the executive and the legislature, and that only a court of law may review their decisions. I'm certain some of you may be having an internal conversation there that we've had the story and we're not happy with it. I think I don't want to go there. All I can say to you and to anyone who wants to be faithful to the Constitution, is that if you want to understand the powers of the Power Protector, the Auditor General, or any of those Chapter 9 institutions, the starting point to understand their powers is Section 181, which establishes them together as a group. What then it means is that if you're saying, for example, if the IEC were to decide that an election that took place in Kailicha was not free and fair, and whoever was elected is not gonna take office tomorrow, and the elections should proceed. If you accept that, you would then not go and take office the following day. Then you should accept that you, you wouldn't proceed doing something wrong or not correcting something wrong if the pub protector has spoken, because they set, they're set up by the same chapter. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope it makes sense, because you wouldn't then say you will go to office until a court of law tells you to leave office, then, uh, because the pub protector is not a court of law. Uh, I don't want to go there again. I just want to say that, uh, we just have to stick with the Constitution. Uh, the, un the understanding being that part of the rule of law is that the laws are certain, they are applied faithfully, and they are not implemented arbitrarily. So each person has to know that if the law says this, or if the law gives me this benefit, then that benefit belongs to me. Just to note also that other organs of state are enjoined to support these institutions. Once you've understood the powers of these institutions under section 181, you then have to go to their specific powers for each institution. In the written paper, which we'll edit very quickly and submit it to you, we have written fully the powers of the power protector. But the important thing is to note that each one of these institutions is given specific powers 
And then it is also said that the law will give it additional powers. The power protector is given three powers. The power to investigate, the power to report, and the power to take appropriate remedial action. In respect of any conduct that is suspected or alleged to be improper within state affairs or the public administration. The other thing that I thought was important to mention for tonight is that the public protector got the third power for the very first time in 1996. Before 1996, the public protector had only two powers. And those two powers are similar to the Auditor General and offices across the globe that are called ombudsman offices. The traditional ones, not the new ones. So it's the power to investigate and to report. So the Auditor General has the power to investigate and report to Parliament. For example, the UK Ombudsman, in terms of Section 10 of the 1967 UK Ombudsman Act, has the power to investigate and report to Parliament. Until 19, until 1993, the power protector had the power to investigate and report to Parliament and to report to the President until 1993. On 1993, when the interim constitution was passed, the power protector got the power to investigate and report, not necessarily to Parliament, to report to the broader public and if it deems fit, if he or she deems fit, to also report to Parliament in 1993. So it was still two powers. 1996, a third power was introduced, which is the power to take appropriate remedial action. This office has also then been given additional powers as envisaged under the Constitution. It, 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 it investigates and reports on violations of the members of the executive under the Executive Members Ethics Act. It is one of the institutions that have the power to investigate alleged acts of corruption under the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. It has the power to protect and receive information from whistleblowers under the Protected Disclosures Act. An interesting power that people haven't heard about as we litigate in courts is that in terms of the national, of the Housing Consumers Protection Measures Act, it has specific review powers, like it says under the Act, appeal and review. So if you're not happy with the decision of the National Home Builders Registration Council, the law of this land says you may apply to the public protector to review the decisions of, of, of the National Home Bill. It is an alternative forum under the Equality Act, and it's, it is a, an office that can assist you in, in relation to the promotion of access to information air. I just want to drive to your conclusion. Why have I taken you to these institutions? It was partly to just talk about the institutions available to enforce rights. Because if laws have to promote peace, they have to be implemented. When implementation and compliance fails, there has to be an avenue for whoever is wronged to vindicate that right. And then the architects of our constitutional democracy have created these avenues. And it's not just in South Africa only. The entire world has looked at if you want a society where the majority of citizens and residents are generally comfortable with the way things are governed, there have to be avenues for them to take their grievances or complaints and these avenues have been expanded. One of the needs, therefore, in regard to embracing these new institutions is a paradigm shift, though. We come from parliamentary supremacy, where parliament was supreme, and there are still many democracies the old democracies, the parliament is supreme. New constitutions such as ours create an environment where the constitution is supreme. In this particular case, then there are various avenues that you can go to, but ultimately, 
the determinant of whose right and wrong is the Constitution as finally interpreted by the courts. For us, why are we important in the equation for peace? Is that the courts are an important enforcer of the law and pillar of democracy. But there are limitations in certain respects. For example, when there's a group of people that need recourse, they need to assert a specific right and they need to follow certain procedures. This is not always possible when people are complaining about service failure. Secondly, if you just one single person, a Gogo Laminu has been wronged, the courts are often very onerous. You need a lawyer. But one of the limitations also of using lawyers is that the dialogue then is exclusive, as I indicated. Somehow, it limits agency by a Gogo Lamini who goes to court. Whereas these administrative bodies, you speak with your own mouth, you understand, so the, so the ability to understand and to be understood is enhanced in these institutions. So they're part of peace building in, 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 in our uh, constitution. Naturally, they then become part of the levers of democracy because a democracy is a dialogue between those who are entrusted with public power and those who have entrusted public power. Going forward, we need to, to, to have that paradigm shift where we accept horizontal accountability. In this regard, I recall President Kruger saying that scrutiny by the judiciary, what is called judicial review, was a principle of the devil. There are parallels between then because he wasn't used to judicial scrutiny. We are now in an era where judicial scrutiny is accepted, but the new kid on the block, so to speak, is administrative scrutiny. We need a situation where, dismiss, where decision makers fully submit to constitutional supremacy including scrutiny by whatever structure is given power by the Constitution. You need decision makers to accept scrutiny by any structure regardless of hierarchy. Ultimately what we need is to accept what we say is horizontal accountability, where the person or structure you're accountable to is not senior to you. I always use an example of a traffic officer, that the rule of law says when the traffic officer says stop, you don't ask how senior are you, you do just that. <laughs> Lastly, we also need lawyers that are original thinkers. Our constitution was created by out-of-the-box thinkers responding to our unique environment. If we're going to take solutions from other democracies as they are and try to transplant them, it is not going to work. The transformative power of our constitution, the transformative value of our laws will be lost. The goals we seek in pursuit of accelerated inclusive development in the next 21 years of democracy will be a pipe dream if we don't fully embrace the provisions of our constitution and the provisions of our law. But if we do embrace the provisions of our constitution and our transformative law, we're not only going to do better in the next, next 21 years on, on the question of social justice, we will also accelerate our performance against the pursuit of Agenda 2063, which has been um, adopted by the African Union. We will also accelerate our performance against the sustainable development goals that we've just adopted. If we do not achieve these goals, though, 
including the goal of social justice, human solidarity and accountability, peace will continue to elude us. In fact, if these are not achieved in all nation states and between nation states, peace will remain a distant goal for another half a century. That means we would not have learned from the lesson that James Patrick Kinney tried to give us about half a century ago. But I'm certain that people in this room, people elsewhere in this country and elsewhere in the world are committed to peace. They are committed to finding solutions. The reason you are in this room is because you are committed to peace. You are committed to ensuring that there is proper constitutional democracy and that there is the rule of law. I'm certain that you also understand that an unaddressed legacy of inequality perpetrates, perpetuates and exacerbates inequality. People wonder why we've become a much more unequal society. If you start with more resources than I have and there isn't a very clear path to reduce the inequalities, in fact, our inequalities are going to grow rather than stay stable. It's a natural mathematical situation. Where do we start then? Respect and promote the rule of law. And it's not the job of lawyers, lawmakers, and those in government. The rule of law belongs to all of us, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu once told us. This includes faithful implementation of the law, faithful compliance with the Constitution, not just compliance with the, law, with the letter, but also compliance with the spirit of the Constitution. We also must respect all accountability institutions, both domestic and international. We must also respect international laws, particularly those we have voluntarily accepted, and customary international law. Ultimately, that will not only ensure that we foster the rule of law and improve the possibility of lasting peace, it would be a way we honor the legacy of Archbishop Tutu and others that have crusaded for justice, democracy, and peace. Thank you. Desmond Tutu, halala! Happy birthday, Galogua, Desmond Tutu, happy birthday! Yala to Galogundi City! Utati la galogena ke utuli kama tonsela. Utati la 